Hi, my name is Walt Ribeiro, and I'm one of Linode's developer advocates. This month, we'll be learning all about the history of Linux in a video series broken into three sections. How Linux came to be, the philosophy of Linux, and the containerization of Linux. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new episodes. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Linux makes up approximately 93% of all computers in the world today. So how did we get here? This story begins in the 1970s when an operating system called Unix, which stands for Uniplex Information and Computer System, was created as an alternative to the system at Bell Labs entitled Multix. At this time, the purpose of Multix was to control mainframes using a technology called multiplexing. But for as powerful as Multix was, it had a fair share of drawbacks. Eventually, the team behind Multix decided to create their own smaller system. And so let's talk about Multix for a second. For their time, Multix and mainframes like it were powerful. However, as you could imagine, these mainframes were extremely expensive and difficult to get access to. Some of the top universities took part in these mainframes, like MIT University, CMU in Pittsburgh, Stanford, Utah Tech, and more. Well, these universities began to timeshare out their mainframes so that students could reserve computational time on them. Users accessed the computers from terminals that were networked to the mainframe. Because a mainframe used by only one user would have periods of downtime, be it seconds or minutes, timesharing allowed multiple users to schedule their operations when the mainframe was inactive. In this way, more users were able to access the mainframe and better optimize their usage. The advent of timesharing and terminals came at an important time in computing. In the 1960s and early 1970s, command line operations were developed at a time when you had to be physically present to move data in or out of a mainframe. Like, you had to walk into a computer mainframe and punch everything in to and from storage. It essentially operated like punch cards that some might be familiar with, or like piano rolls, where compressed air would read the data. Here, let me show you. So here you'll see that there's this old piano roll and I will unroll it. And as I unroll it, you'll notice that it's gonna have these little holes inside the paper. And that air compression is actually read manually through the piano and it creates notes. So I'm gonna play for you right now and show you how punch cards work. And a fun fact, the first storage mechanism was created in Philadelphia. And so this physical punch in, punch out led to the question, how will we ever get info out of a computer? A human interface device had never been considered outside of punch cards. So how do we interact without punch cards? In this time period, people were trying to figure out not just how an operating system should work, but how a computer should work. Like how QWERTY keyboards were engineered to prevent crossbar travel from typewriters. It was all just a learning process to solve problems that you would have never considered beforehand. Anyway, now back to networking. You no longer had to physically be at the computer to use it, maintain it, or take data from it. You simply access the mainframe from a terminal. Unix came about because as a result of all the good work done by Bell Labs and MIT with the Multic system. But the scope of Multics had become unwieldy, and as Bell Labs abandoned it, its developers looked to make something more simple, without sacrificing all the benefits that Multics provided. Shortly thereafter, they created the system that we all know today as Unix. Dennis Ritchie, one of the lead developers of Unix, states, What we wanted to preserve was not just a good environment in which to do programming, but a system around which a fellowship could form. We knew from experience that the essence of communal computing as supplied by remote access and timeshared machines is not just to type programs into a terminal instead of a key punch, but to encourage close communication. Unix quickly grew in popularity around Bell Labs and eventually schools and universities. Within a decade, it was ported to the C language, which made it extremely portable meaning a wide variety of machines could run the operating system. Then, during the 80s, Unix started to diverge in many ways, with many variants of the operating system, and many early computing companies that we know of today shipped their computers with different variants of Unix. This is where Linux comes in. In 1991, a man named Linus Torvalds was unhappy with MS-DOS and Minix, a version of Unix that he was using at the University of Helsinki. So he made his own Unix clone and called it Linux. 
But at this time, there was a licensing philosophy called NU, spelled G-N-U, which was a Richard Stallman's concept that guaranteed end users the freedom to run, study, share, and modify any new licensed software. It was about software being free as in freedom. And so Linux is basically a Linus brand Unix featuring the new license. And another fun fact, Linux wasn't always open source. Early versions of Linux were distributed with a license forbidding commercial use or distros. It wasn't until version 0.12, released in 1992, that saw Linus adopt the GPL. And that's when it really started to explode. We'll continue that in the following episode. Make sure that you're subscribed here to the Linode YouTube channel so you don't miss it.